Our Holy Gospel is from Mark chapter 10, verses 23 and following. Then Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, How hard will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were perplexed at his words, but Jesus said to them, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded, and they said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them, and he said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. And I just read the passage that comes right after the passage I was going to read to you. <laughs> that was 23 and following, but I actually, um, actually referenced that in my sermon, so that was probably a God thing. <laughs> that was 23 to 27. What I wanted to read was 17 to 23, so I'm going to now read that backwards. <laughs> I thought the reading glasses would help. <laughs> As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I've, I've kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and he said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked, and he went away grieving. For that rich man had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, How hard will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And then we get into that camel thing. <laughs> this is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. <laughs> On the 4th of July, a bunch of us walked in the parade in Dale City with Lucille our VBS mascot, with 3,000 freezer pops and a bunch of smiles and hearty invitations for neighborhood children to join us in Vacation Bible School. We were asked to meet up in the parking lot of the Boys and Girls Club, and with all the people from other floats, um, there, you know, a bunch of floats were there, and it was fun to chit-chat with people who were also getting ready for the parade with their own organizations and we were talking with them about their church or with their band or their sports team or whomever it was that they were marching for on that day. Well I took a break from our little corner in the lot to go over and take my turn at the porta potty because that's what I do um, and there were a few of us in line there. When two groups from two different floats approached at the same time. One group was wearing red t-shirts and one group was wearing blue t-shirts and they were each promoting their candidate for governor. Yes, one group was at for Terry McCullough and the other was for Ken Cuccinelli. And mind you, each group was just giggling and having fun on their way over to the porta potty. They were, you know, they're going to be in a parade. That's a fun thing for people to do. Now, if you're not from around here, or if you haven't seen the ads or heard the debate, you may not know that this is heating up to be a pretty bitter contest. And I'm not here to take a stand for the gubernatorial race. I wasn't there in the line for the restroom to do that either. I was in the line to pee. <laughs> But I was surprised that both groups who acted so jovial on their walk over to the Don's John, once they got there and they saw that their opponents were in line, they just clammed up. They, even, they, they not only didn't talk to each other, they, they didn't talk to people from their own race. 
I mean, they crossed their arms. They looked at the ground. They kicked stones. They were grumpy. You wouldn't think that anybody was going to pass out candy to any child at all. They just stood in silence. Well, you guys know me. My friends don't call me the great tension breaker for nothing. So after marveling at the silence for a few minutes, I looked at the people in blue, and I looked at the people in red, and I looked at the Dons, John, and I said, well, here we are in line for the restroom. You know, the restroom. It's the great equalizer. And nobody left. <laughs> I mean, come on. That was funny. <laughs> Even a couple of you laughed. I expected more, but maybe it wasn't fine. <laughs> but it also became a perfect glimpse of how we can get so caught up in our differences that we forget that most... We, we forget that those most important things in life are the things that actually make us the same, not different. So we've been wait making our way through the question box this summer, where, where rather than I just guessed what might be helpful for you for me to preach about, I asked you to write down the topics that you wanted me to address. What's going to help you bring faith and life together? And one of those topics was, what does God think about homosexuality? What do we do with all the clobber verses in scripture where, where people try to quickly bash folks who are gay? And the question went on, citing particular verses, and I'm familiar with them, and I want to address them, and I will this morning. This might not be the best forum to have discussions about them, and I'm open for those. I'm open for Bible studies and discussions and talks over coffee and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I don't want to say this is the last conversation about it, but I do want this to begin conversations about it. Bef before I get too deeply into those conversations, I want to back up and I want to start with the mission and the vision of River of Grace and tell you why we choose an intentional choice to be a welcoming and affirming congregation for everyone, whether they're gay or straight. Our mission here is that we love God and we love others. So when we discern whether we want to begin a new ministry or if we want to start a new program or if we want to invest our resources, we make sure that it lines up with love God, love others. If you've worshipped here before, ever, you've heard me say at the time of communion that we celebrate open communion. <coughs> and that means that everyone is welcome. Everyone. If you've looked through the Q&As on our website, you may have seen that among the questions that are listed there, listed like, what does River of Grace do for the world, and if I decide to come to River of Grace, what should I wear? and others, there's also a question that says, I'm gay, am I still welcome? And the answer to the question is this. We welcome all people without regard to their race, their income, the place where they live, their sexual orientation, or whether or not they like Brussels sprouts. We're just looking forward to meeting you. And by the way, God loves you, remember that. That's how we put it. Now, I'm our webmaster, and I write the content that goes onto our website. Someone asked me early on, hey, is that really a frequently asked question, or did you just have a list of questions you wanted to put on the website? And my answer was, well, I, I guess it depends on what you mean by frequent. But in two months, I've been asked twice. So that averages two once a month. But in 20 years of ordained ministry, I have met dozens and dozens and dozens of people who've been asked to leave their church or to step away from the communion table or to convert their ways 
or who've been told that they burn in hell just because they happen to be gay. Now mind you, many of these people have been gracious, loving, faith-filled, kind, and curious about life. Just like the heterosexual people I know. There's just been that one slight difference about who they fall in love with. And so I understood that question in the question box. But I also understood the pain that was behind the question. What do you do with all the clobber verses in scripture where people try to quickly bash folks who are gay? Which is another way of asking, how can I respond when people try to hurt me with scripture because they do? So yes, at a quick read or a surface read, there are verses of scripture which can make one think that homosexuality is something that God condemns. But quick reads of scripture aren't enough. They just aren't. It's better to read scripture with what we call the historical critical method, which means that we look at the time in which chapters and verses were written, who wrote them, who the audience may have been, what the goal may have been, and what was happening immediately and after the texts were written. Every mainline denomination, Lutherans, Catholics, Presbyterians, Methodists, United Church of Christ, even Unitarians, and others too, read scripture with a historical critical method. And that's the hard part about just taking a Bible down from the shelf, playing what some people call Bible bingo, and picking a verse and saying what it means. There's that old joke about someone who says, I'm going to do whatever the Bible tells me to do. I'm going to pick a couple of verses in scripture and see what it says. And they go to Judas hanged himself. And they say, oh, and then they go to another one. It says, go and do likewise. <laughs> you can't read the Bible that way. You've got, to know what, you've got to know what you're reading. And it's a hard book to read. It takes investment. And you wouldn't go to your investment banker and just open up a pamphlet and say, okay, I'm going to invest my stock in this without finding out what's going on before in the trends there. So it's important to understand what is going on in scripture. If you don't know, you're going to miss some things. You might find a passage that says, for if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it's disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. I've seen a lot of you married people not wearing hats. Better watch out. <laughs> or how about this one? Happy are those who seize your children and smash them against a rock. <laughs> Psalm 137, verse 9. <laughs> Anybody want to endorse like playtime at the park? <laughs> you got to be really careful about just picking out a scripture and running with it. And also, just like you can find these harsh verses in scripture, you can also just poke around and find nice ones too, comforting ones, good ones. In fact, three weeks ago, I gave you a handout um, that, with a bunch of them that said, when you're feeling anxious, check out this verse. Or if you're feeling lonely, check out this verse. Or um, if you're feeling overwhelmed, here's a verse that can help you. So it's the opposite of clobber verses, or maybe it's the clobber them with grace verses. But for these two, it helps to know the story behind the story. And so this is, and that maybe that's why God had my eyes go to that verse, or maybe I just made a good old-fashioned mistake. Can't blame God for everything I mess up. <laughs> but I, I really did have this in my, in my manuscript. Um, Jesus says it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Now I know that Beck sews, and I know Ruth sews, and maybe we have other seamstresses in here, or, or um, you know, tailors in here. But if you've ever like even tried to sew a button on, and if you've ever been to a cutting tube, you might wonder, now how, <laughs> how, how would a camel get through the eye of a needle? And it looks like maybe I should just go ahead and give up all hopes of heaven right now. Because a camel just can't do that. 
But there's a really interesting thing about this that Jesus doesn't go into. The Bible doesn't write down when we get to that passage that I read for you. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Well, the deal is there was a protective wall, or still is, around Jerusalem. And the way that you can get into the old city of Jerusalem is by going through these gates in this stone wall. Those are actually called the eye of the needle. So if someone was rich, they would have a lot of their possessions packed up on their what? Camel. Their camel. <laughs> and so if you got to the eye of the needle, your camel wouldn't fit through there. So that's Jesus' point. It helps us to just know the history of some of these passages. When the psalmist says in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, he's not talking about angioplasty. That would be a problem because they didn't start doing that until a few decades ago. He's talking about a prayerful life that removes distraction and heartache and focuses on God at the center. How we read scripture is just as important as what it says. So now with all that background, let's look at a few of these clobber verses. And let's look at what's behind it. There are 66 books in the Bible, and there are six passages that reference homosexuality. It's a small ratio, really. Notably, Jesus doesn't say any of them. None of them. And the understanding of homosexuality then was very different than it is now. There's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It happens in Genesis 19, and the story is of a bunch of strangers coming to town and the townspeople wanting to um, have their way with them. I think you know what I mean. You have some kids in the room. So uh, the townspeople wanted to have their way with them. Lodge sees this coming. He knows this is going to happen. So he says, why don't you come into my palace? You're going to be protected from these townspeople. And um, the, the strangers come into the palace. And the townspeople say, no, we actually do want to do what's a, a, a gang rape sort of thing here. With And Lot says, I don't, you know, I don't think that's a very good idea. I don't want to let these people out of the house. Let me give you my two daughters who are both virgins, and you can have your way with them. I was at the um, Prince William County Fair, and I saw a guy wearing a t-shirt that says, my daughter's allowed to date when she's 45. <laughs> Not before. <laughs> so, you know, this is a completely different culture, right? So, yeah, God does put his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah because the townspeople did have their way. So, comparing homosexual sex to what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah is very different than comparing the relationship of a lifelong relationship. It's just, it's like comparing apples and hammers. They just don't, they just don't connect. But God wasn't happy about inhospitality. God wasn't happy about abuse. The issue in reading Genesis 19 is about sex outside of a covenant relationship. It's not about homosexuality. There's another passage, it's later, it's in Leviticus. And that has to do more with religious taboo, ritual impurity, not really sexual ethics. There were all kinds of uh, important rules that these people of the covenant, these Israelites, had to do as they wandered across the, the desert and as they kept up their part of the bargain as God's chosen people. What they could eat, what they could not eat, um, how they could conduct themselves, 
every one of it, all, all sorts of things to keep them insiders into the covenant. It's also important to note that the Israelites were making their way across the desert to get to the promised land. They didn't have a GPS. This was taking a lot longer than expected. And they were dying quickly. They were dying off. And they had figured out where babies came from. And they figured out where they didn't come from. They wanted to make sure that their progeny would go on. They needed to make little Israelites. And they needed to make sure that they would have chosen people that would appear in the promised land. Their transport was taking years. It would be 40 years before they got there. And so they were very protective of intimacy happening between males and females. And so that's part of where the Leviticus passage comes from. And then there's a passage in the first chapter of Romans. This is, the, this is where this appears in the, in the New Testament. Again, Jesus doesn't talk about homosexual relationships ever. But Paul talks about um, homosexual relationships. Paul also talks about never getting divorced. Jesus does talk about never getting divorced. I think a lot of us in this room have been divorced. Now we're back to cutting your hair. Um, maybe some of us who've been divorced have been clobbered with some of those verses. And if you have, and if it's people in the church who've done the clobbering, I'm sorry to hear that. Heartbroken about it, really. Because the church should be a place of refuge and love, forgiveness and grace and new starts. But back to Paul, Romans 1. It's a lengthy passage. It talks about what's natural and what's unnatural. It's the only place that physical intimacy between women is mentioned, including physical intimacy between men. And a lot of this is focused on the word unnatural. In the Greek, the original language of the, of the Bible, the word is paraphism, which in Paul's usage means... Um, not really unnatural, but atypical, or beyond what is ordinary or usual. The word paraphysin is a verb that's also ascribed to God in the, word, in the book of Romans. So paraphysin is a word that describes God. And certainly God can't be unnatural. So it's just atypical. Now I'm not going to get into the details about ways that Intimacy can be atypical or unusual. But let's just, no, I'm not even going to do that. <laughs> My parents are in the room. <laughs> but if you say that God is atypical, just look at the giraffe. You know, look at, look at your strange cousin. I mean, <laughs> any, but any, there's all kinds of things that are unusual in this world. Anything that's not normal is typical. Anything that's not usual. So it's not really a pejorative word. It's not really an unusual word. It, it's just not normal. But anyway, the point of this is that Paul isn't talking so much about an ethical judgment about same-sex acts. But he mentions them to teach people that supposed impurities really don't have an importance in Christ. The whole book of Romans is about how it's Christ's mercy that gets us into God's heart. It's not our actions or our works or our good looks or our charm or our wit or anything else. It's simply what Christ does on the cross. Now, we live in a world where there are just too many divisions. Thousands of people marched yesterday, remembering that that march 50 years ago and reclaiming the infamous dream of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whereby people wouldn't be divided but united. <coughs> he talked about skin color and race relations. And sadly, 50 years later, those battles still aren't over. And our equality issues aren't just skin deep. And that's why it's important that we look into scripture and listen carefully for the grace and the unity inside its pages. 
The gospel I read for you today is the story of the rich man. The guy who thought that by his life he had it all figured out. And you know, he had the commandments down pat. No adultery, no stealing, no false witness, or lying, or cooking the books, or running yellow lights, or cheating on his taxes, or whatever it was. He did all that. But there was one thing that he lacked. There was this one thing. And that's that he wasn't willing to sell everything he had and give it to the poor. Now, do you suppose that Jesus wanted him to have a big old garage sale? I don't think so. I don't think that's what he was after. I think that Jesus wanted him to just be willing to let go of some of the assumptions that kept him inside a cocoon that was four inches or four feet too thick. See, he was insulated from a compassion that would help him really engage in the world. And that brothers and sisters, is what that question on the card was really all about. What can we do with the clobber verses? Why are there so many people who want to hurt us? Where can there be healing? Why do too many people who happen to be gay and lesbian wonder if God even exists? Why does the church hurt people, and what can I do to help? Now, I started out today by telling you about the line for the restroom at the parade and how I called the need to go to the bathroom the great equalizer between the political parties. Well, indeed, we all have that in common here. Occasionally, no matter our feelings on human sexuality, we all are going to need to be. <laughs> but we have something even bigger in common, and that is the waters of baptism. That's the bread and cup of Holy Communion. And that's what happened on the cross. That's that Jesus loved us so much that he came down to us. Because God said, I want to equalize you. You guys can't figure me out with your heads. And you probably can't even figure me out with your hearts. But I love you so much that I'm going to give it all for you. And you can't earn me, and you can't deserve me, and... I can go to the ends of the earth and even beyond, and actually when life is over, I can show up for you that way too. Because God wants us to see life in new ways. We're making a difference to make a difference here at River of Grace, and it's working. Lives are being touched. Hearts are being healed. Hope is being born, and the world is better for it. The story of the rich man from the gospel today is unique in that we do know that the man went away sad because he'd had great wealth. What we don't know is if he ever came back. We don't know if his heart ever softened or if he stayed sad. But we do know that in these waters of baptism, in these gifts of communion, and in the promise of our cross, that Jesus' heart is always open to everyone. Everyone, Jew and Greek, male and female, slave and free, black and white, the blue shirts and the red shirts, the gay and the straight, the saint and the sinner, me and you, and you, and you, and you. And that's why we're here, to love God.